some people might say you're a brand new agency. Uh, we don't want to do business with you yet until you get to be big. And yeah, that's not how we work. You know, agents have to also understand they, as much as they want to write business, they don't have to quote everything. You have to be able to sit down and educate your client or your prospect on why that's important. Because if an underwriter in this market can't reasonably assume they're gonna be competitive on an account, they're gonna decline it and move on to the next one that they have all the information on. We're here to bring value, um, not just be another wholesaler. I hear agents grumble all the time about, oh, it's taken me forever to get quotes back. It's taken me, you know, the underwriter doesn't return calls. They don't do this, they don't do that. What makes us different of, of our competitors is really we do business in the non-admitted space and the admitted space. Agents don't really understand we're, this is an adversarial relationship. It is not supposed to be us against them in any way, shape, or form. We're dance partners with the same objective. My journey in the insurance industry started at age 17. Don't overestimate it. Don't underestimate it. Give us a real number that we can shoot at. And we're going to get as close to that number as we can. What's your advice to the agents out there that feel like they're just not, they're just not getting uh, the same level of service in the hard market. Get to know your underwriters. Get to know the company you're working with. And then at that point, everyone's life will be smoother because we all have the same goal. A lot of people, you get one time to screw up. And if you do it, you're automatically going to get thrown under the bus from somebody. I just feel like we need to do a better job of as agents sometimes of making sure that even though it sucks to have to give a hard message, you have to give that. My goal at Bracefield, our goal, is to help you, the agent, place an account. For those of you that are in Killing Commercial and coming to Producers in Paradise, listen up, this guy's gonna be there. What's up everybody? Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast where we are refining and redefining the sales game. One of the ways you gotta do that in the hard market is to have good wholesale partners. And if you've listened to me for any length of time, you know that I am not a big believer in having tons and tons of wholesalers in my agency. I just don't, I don't understand why agencies do that. I feel like wholesalers are all created equal when it comes to the insurance piece, but not when it comes to the relationship in the execution piece. And so when you find the people who have the right contracts and they marry that with the right underwriter and the right people further up the, the line that can help you when you need, you need help, you don't let those people go. And I've told the story time and time again, that the very first underwriter at a wholesaler I ever worked with was Trina Swartz. God bless her. She passed away last spring. She wrote the very first policy that I wrote when I got my license. And she was in my agency for the last almost 20 years. And when Trina passed away, it left a huge gap in the relationship end of our wholesale relationship. But the good news is that opened the door for our guest today, Mr. John Barfield from Bracefield, and that's the only time I'm going to say that because I'm afraid I'm always going to get it backwards, but he came to me because somebody that's probably fairly well known to you that listen, Ciara Gravier, told me I needed to talk to this guy, and I really don't take meetings with wholesalers. They're always walking in, always wanting to talk about when they can you know, get some, some business from us or contract with us, and I just... Very, very rarely will take those meetings, but because Ciara recommended him and because he had an interest in becoming part of the Killing Commercial community overall, I took the meeting and I got to tell you, it's been a really good relationship for us thus far. Now, in full transparency, I told John when we met, I'm just going to stick my toe in the water and we'll see how the temperature is and we'll grow from there. And so far, I haven't been too hot, haven't been too cold. It seems like the water's just right. So we're continuing to expand on that relationship at Florida Risk. But we're going to talk about all things Bracefield today. And for those of you that are in Killing Commercial and coming to Producers in Paradise, listen up. This guy's going to be there. He's going to talk as part of a panel uh, with the other wholesalers that are niche-focused. And they're going to just talk about the wholesaler retail agent relationship. I know I have my thoughts. I'm sure he has his thoughts, but we're going to get into it right now. So welcome John Barfield from Bracefield. What's going wow. on, my man? Thank you, David. I appreciate that. That was a great intro and um, I'm super glad to be here. 
Uh, yeah, you're right. Ciara, you know, she uh, told me that I had to be part of this community. And um, she told me that probably a year ago, and uh, I did not. And then she told me that again six months after that and six months after that. And finally, I said, you know, there there must be something to this. So uh, I'm glad to be part of it and glad you have me on the podcast today. You know, we're a wholesaler. Uh, we do business across the country. And I would tell you what makes us different of, of our competitors is really we do business in the non-admitted space and the admitted space. Uh, we write you know, all kinds of business, small business to larger business. And so it really just depends on what the agent is looking to place. Uh, that's, that's really what we do. So talk a little bit about your background. How did you get to where you're at right now with Bracefield? Give everybody sort of the runway to you being in your current role, because you're kind of the guy at Bracefield, right? I mean, you're the go-to. Well, I, I had the privilege of being the leader at Bracefield. Go. That's for sure. And that, you know, that started back in uh, in 2015. Uh, our leadership came to me and said, you know, you've you've done a lot of different things for this organization, uh, producer, IT, uh, marketing operations, and we'd like you to step up and leave the office. Uh, and that was, you know, that's an honor for me. And, you know, I know, uh, you know, we have 55 teammates uh, it, at our office and, you know, everybody's a teammate. We, we don't have employees here at Bracefield. And so uh, everybody's a teammate and, and I'm proud to be their leader. In, in my, you know, my journey in the insurance industry started at age 17. I uh, started right out of high school. Uh, I was one of those kids that was not the smartest kid uh, in the class. Parents couldn't afford to send me to college and I wasn't going to get a scholarship. So I, uh, my mother knew someone in, the in, in an insurance agency uh, down in South Florida, Davie, Florida, as a matter of fact. Uh, and um, I got a job in the file room. And back then, you know, this is, uh, you know, back in 1988, there were that files. started. So, you know, there <laughs> were paper files. I know a lot of people listening and watching today don't ever think that there were paper files. But let me tell you, we had cabinets and cabinets of them. And they were the old style cabinet, you know, not the new style in tab folders and all that kind of stuff. But nonetheless, you know, my, my big thing back then, you know, being a 17 year old is you look in the parking lot and you see the cars that people are driving that work in the agency that you're working for and the houses they live in. And you, you think, wow, you know, I kind of, I'd like to have that. Um, didn't realize how much work it would take back then to get that. Uh, but every time someone left the company, I raised my hand and said, I can do it uh, because I had confidence in myself. And so, you know, over time, you know, I, I progressed within the agency, eventually got my own office uh, that I ran. And then the company sent me to Central Florida to open additional locations. Uh, and, you know, after 10 years of being in the agency side, a friend of mine had come over to Bracefield and said, you know, wow, this is it's pretty awesome. So we joined, he joined in 97. Uh, and in 98, I joined Bracefield. And so this year I celebrate my 26th year in the business or in uh, at Bracefield. And so um, I started off in marketing, uh, worked in underwriting, IT you know, that was an interesting uh, turn of events, but, you know, kind of just went throughout the business and learned everything that I, other than accounting, um, I'm not an accounting guy, but, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I know enough that. to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I know how to read a P&L and, and know how to find the right people that uh, can give me the answers. And, you know, that's kind of what I do, but, you know, it's, it's, this business is such a great business. You meet so many awesome people. And, um, you know, it's something that I've enjoyed being part of. And so, you know, it's, that's how I got started. And, you know, Bracefield, uh, we're a generalist. Uh, we, in the past, we used to specialize in condo associations and pretty much all we did. Uh, but after taking the leadership role, um, on the, you know, back in 2015, I knew that that market was changing. I knew that we had to really 
broaden what we did or else we wouldn't be around today. And, you know, we did that and and now we've got all the markets to be competitive uh, out there. So along your journey, you've probably seen pretty much everything at this point, and that includes different kinds of agencies. And I think that we're like, you've been in it a little bit longer than I have, not that much, but maybe just long enough to where still the, the years where we had the, like five major storms come through were worse than what we're dealing with now. I don't know. I feel like I came in right on the tail end of that and the market finally caught up and became really, really hardened at that point. But from other than my, maybe my first year or two in the industry, this last year to 18 months, has been brutal. It's been the hardest insurance marketplace that I've witnessed because it's been non-discriminatory in lines. With the exception of workers' comp in Florida, pretty much everything else is really, really tough to deal with mm -hmm. right now. And, you know, I hear agents grumble all the time about, oh, it's taken me forever to get quotes back. It's taken me, you know, the underwriter doesn't return calls. They don't do this. They don't do that. And I hear it not just in Florida. And, and I want to be very clear. I don't hear that in my office. I hear that in other places. And I always wonder, what's the other side of the of the story on this, right? What, what's the wholesale side of the story? Because I have to believe, based on my experience specifically with our underwriter at Bracefield is absolutely fantastic. Probably the closest thing to who she's replacing in my agency that I've run into. So I have zero complaints. We don't have a problem with return calls. We do not have a problem with getting submissions turned around in time. But I think that sometimes agents don't really understand where this is an adversarial relationship. It is not supposed to be us against them in any way, shape or form. We're dance partners with the same objective and we need to to be stepping step by step in unison with each other. And I feel like in what I hear, and then when I what I see, that a lot of the times agents just haven't figured out that when the market's gotten harder, underwriters aren't necessarily equipped with 36 hours and 24 hours out of the day to chase around information try and make incomplete submissions complete, try and understand what a business is doing because they don't get a narrative with the submission explaining the account and the relationship and what needs to happen, you know, what what we're trying to accomplish. So I'm interested in your side, you know, as the market is hardened, I don't see any service gaps whatsoever from Bracefield, but I also don't feel like my people are giving making you work any harder than you absolutely need to to be able to write accounts. What would you give it? What advice would you give to agents that whether it's working with Bracefield or any wholesaler right now to get that same turnaround time that they would have gotten? And I want to throw one more thing on there before you answer that. People, if you don't invest in your relationships in the soft market, don't make the phone calls in the hard looking for favors. Okay. Here's the thing if you're going to have a wholesale relationship, it's a relationship 12 months out of the year, every single year. And it goes back to what I said. I had a solo episode on the podcast a few months back where I talked about Aesop's fable of the ant and the grasshopper and how the ant worked all summer when the weather was great and everybody had plentiful food while the grasshopper just sort of laid back and rested and, and didn't really do anything to prepare for the impending winter. Everybody knew winter was coming, but didn't do anything with it. And when winter came, the grasshopper didn't have a place to stay that was warm, didn't have any food. And so they went to the ant. The ant helped them, but the ant was prepared because they had put the work in the entire time. It's no different with the relationship with your underwriters. It's really easy to go and get people to shop on price and compete against other wholesalers or even your direct markets at that point when the market's soft. But at the end of the day, you're going to need those people when the market hardens. And if you haven't made that investment in the times where you were fat and happy, don't go to them when it's when the times are lean because they only have so much capacity and they're going to focus that on the areas where they have had investment from the agents and the agencies. I want to be very clear that 100% is my opinion. It is not the opinion of John that I'm aware of. It is not the opinion of Bracefield. So I don't want anybody thinking that, that, that I teed that up for him to come in and pile on. What I want John to say is what's your advice to the agents out there that feel like they're just not, they're just not getting 
uh, the same level of service in the hard market. Listen to what David said. <laughs> you know, I mean, in all seriousness, yeah, I mean, that that's exactly, you know, we we return calls, we return emails. We're not perfect and no one is, but I can tell you that, you know, those agents that are our friends all year long in the hard, in the soft market, those agents that get quotes and they bind them, they're certain. And by the way, give us complete submissions. They get quotes faster. They get better quotes when that happens. So, you know, whether you're uh, working with Bracefield, you're working with another wholesaler, get that wholesaler a complete submission. Uh, uh, we work with agents of all different sizes. And so, you know, large agents don't get preference over small agents. Small agents, you know, are the ones that have traditionally, you know, and small is a relative term and sure. at any given point. Uh, so brand new agencies, we work with brand new agencies. We believe in, in, in helping agencies navigate the commercial space. Uh, and, you know, small agencies grow up to be big agencies in many cases. So, you know, uh, some people might say you're a brand new agency. Uh, we don't want to do business with you yet until you get to be big. Yeah, that's not how we work. But, you know, for those those agencies that are consistently sending us submissions, the ones that have complete submissions, the one that sends the, the ones that send the narratives, they understand the business. And if they don't understand, they ask, what is it you need? And then we help them through that. We navigate them through that. And then they do give us the submissions at that point. But yeah, you're right. You know, you you have to be a friend of your underwriter and your underwriter has to be a friend of you. Really, that's how it comes down to, you know, I talk to our team about getting out to visit our agents. We have to do it because and we have to do it all the time, whether the agency is is. Uh, has a lot of business or has a little bit of business, we want to get out there and see them so that they can learn who we are. Uh, it's very easy to lose sight of that fact if you have uh, agencies, you know, agents that you don't know who they are and they don't know who you are. So you you mentioned your underwriter. Your under, underwriter happens to be Brittany. Um, Dynamite, she knows how to pick up the phone. She knows how to answer an email. But more than that, I think, you know, we have our underwriters that are the really the face of that relationship and that partnership, but they have a team behind them, you know, and, and you know, because they can not always uh, be in the office or or whatnot, and they they rely on that team. So Brittany's got a great team and, you know, I wouldn't expect anything other than the service level that you're getting. So, so let me ask you this. I want to back up for just a second because I've said it. You've said it, and I mean, it's pretty probably elementary, and I feel like the two of us are on the same page here, but there's a lot of people who listen to the podcast that are newer producers that aren't getting support at their agency, so they really don't even know some of the basic things, and it's not a knock on them, but a complete submission to somebody new in the industry versus a complete submission to you and I sitting here talking about it are likely two completely different things. So first off, I would ask you, you know, what does a complete submission look like for Bracefield, number one? And then the second part of that is, what are the things that you just commonly see that you're not getting, that you're having to go back and ask for or follow up on that are holding the process up that you absolutely have to have? Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, you have to give me a rating basis. You know, are we rating on payroll, square footage? You know, what what is it? Um, and we get you know, some applications that are completely missing any of that information. And so, you know, obviously we have to send it back at that point. Uh, if it's a particular uh, specialty, like a restaurant or a contractor, there's going to be a supplemental application that we need to have all that information on. Uh, you know, in, in many cases, you know, we'll quote off any supplement, you know, sub app that we get, uh, but we need to have that type of, of uh, supplemental application to you know, for restaurant, uh, contractor, et cetera. But, you know, your, your typical applications and, you know, what we do is we go through and, you know, for those newer agents that really aren't familiar with what they need to 
supply to us. We go through, we highlight the application. We tell them these are the fields that you need to complete in order to be able to you know, get a get a quote on that risk. Um, so, you know, that's how we help them out. We help navigate them through the process. I think the other thing, and this is a big one right now in this market, we just had our new producers call for Killing Commercial today. Not that I'm going to give away all the goods behind the, the closed doors, but I think it's valuable for anybody who's a newer producer, or maybe not even a newer producer. If you're an older producer, nobody's ever explained this to you before. But a big one, and I don't know how paramount it is in your world, but it's target premium, man. Like I, It blows my mind that as agents, we get so irritated when somebody sends us deck pages and it's got premiums blacked out or some level of information missing. And yet when the wholesale underwriter or our underwriter asks for a target or expiring, we do the exact same thing to them. It's the most fickle thing I've ever seen in my life. But, you know, I think it goes beyond that. And, and what we were talking about in our call where I was explaining this to the newer producers is you have to be able to sit down and educate your client or your prospect on why that's important. Because if an underwriter in this market can't reasonably assume they're going to be competitive on an account, they're going to decline it and move on to the next one that they have all the information on. And I want to be really, really clear about this because I think it's really important to understand they're not asking you for the target premium so that they can undercut the incumbent. They're asking you for the target premium so they can look at the loss runs, create a premium versus loss summary or a loss ratio, which should be part of your submission or in your narrative anyhow. And it's going to tell them whether or not they have anybody at all that is going to be able to compete based on where something currently is. And it blew, blew my mind. There was a guy that was on the new producer's call who said, working with a large account, roughly $350,000 in premium, and he got nothing. Like they had completely taken all of the premiums off of the off of the um, information they sent over to him. And the reason was because the person who was leading the company had been in the insurance industry before and they knew how the game was played. And I said, well, that doesn't mean they knew how to play the right game. You know, at the end of the day, let me ask you this. Do you have the loss runs? And he said, well, no, I haven't gotten those yet. And I said, so do you think that when this person sends you the loss information over, it's going to be blank? And he and he said, well, no. And I said, well, why would the premiums be blank then? They're equally as important when it comes to an underwriter making an initial decision on an account. And I said, listen, I said, I'm going to give you the hack. The hack is when you get the loss runs, if they've already calculated the loss ratio on the loss runs, just solve for X with X being the premium. And then you can go back and you can show them, here's where our premium is versus last year's. And they're going to actually have a hemorrhage because they can't figure out where you found out their numbers. But not every loss run breaks down and gives you the loss ratio at the bottom of it. Some of them do, some of them don't. But I want the agents out there to understand, you have to educate your clients why this is important. It's not just because... You know, somebody who is not going to be competitive is going to get out. It may be somebody could be really, really competitive and still be profitable based on their own modeling. And they decide they probably can't be because they don't even know where they're going to fall in the grand scheme of things. So this goes back to educating your client, educating your prospect on why you need the information and not to mention the fact you have to operate in full transparency. If you've got somebody, I, I likened it to getting married, right? I think that there are a lot of times people get married and they think that their significant other is going to change after they get married. And it's not always for the better because you hadn't lived with them up until that point in many cases. And then all of a sudden you move in. Those first couple of years can get real rocky real quick when you learn around about each other's bad habits that you didn't know that you had. But guess what? If this person that's a prospect for you is giving you a hard time right now, they're not going to change when you get married to them. So you either need to figure out if they're going to be able to, to, to give you the information you need after you educate them, or you need to cut bait and move on to the person who's not going to be a pain for you the rest of your existence. The other thing that I think is, Hey, what's, what's the deal with, with, um, with oh shoot i lost my train of thought son of a gun I, I had a good one it'll come back to me anyhow regardless 
my question was, what are the, what, you know, what's a complete submission? What are the things that, you know, what are the common things that you see missing? And I mean, I never would have thought it would have been exposure base. I never would have yeah. thought it would have been the supplemental application. No, I could understand well, premium versus stuff, yeah. loss summary or whatever else, but holy cow, that, that blows my mind. Well, you know, it, it, yeah, it, it, you would not think that those would be things that would be missing, but yeah, we do get a lot of submissions that way. Uh, the other thing, you know, back to your target premium. Yeah. I think what, some agents believe that if they give a target premium that we're going to come back with a premium that is, um, you know, if you said that it needed to be 5,000, but you really needed to be 6,000, then we can come in somewhere in between. And we just need a, we need to a reasonable uh, premium target. Don't don't overestimate it. Don't underestimate it. Give us a real number that we can shoot at, and we're going to get as close to that number as we can. You know, no one is looking to hit home runs on these, especially if it's a realistic target. You know, if you give us something that's completely under the market, we're going to just go away. You know, we're not going to work on that because we know that you haven't done the homework. You have no idea what you're doing, and <laughs> You know, at that point, then, you know, is it something we really want to be working on or not? Uh, if you give us a target that's realistic, then we can go and we could say, you know what? We know who the incumbent is. We know what your premium target is. We're, we're not going to be able to get close to that. If, you know, I tell agents, if if we quoted every single submission that came across our desk, we would never get to yours. And, you know, and and certainly um, in a in a market where it's a super hard market, the submission volume is just tremendous, and you really have to take the swings at the ones that you believe are or that you're going to have a chance at getting. And so, you know, if you get too many of those submissions, you quote every one of them without target premiums or anything like that. Then you have agents saying, you know what, your turnaround time is too slow. So we don't do it. We we simply look at the relationships with the agents that we have. Again, we understand if it's a new relationship, new partnership, we're going to take a little bit more time. We're going to educate them. But the ones that have been doing – and this is getting back to the original thing, which is get to know your underwriters. Get to know the company you're working with. And then at that point, everyone's life will be smoother because we all have the same goal. Number one, take care of the customer, you know, without a doubt. And then the next thing is write the business. 100%. And so. my uh, ADHD moment has now brought me back to clarity. What I was going to say is if these people are difficult, they're likely also going to have a greater chance of being an E and O for your agency, because if you're a newer agent and you let people push you around and what they're going to give you and what they're not, the reality of the matter is you don't have the experience to ask all the right questions at this point in your career. You don't know what you don't know and what you're missing. And so I would, I, I was talking about it on our new, new producers call I would love to see a study that shows the number of ENO claims that came from people who were obviously a pain in the butt before you ever brought them into your book of business, because those are always the people that aren't going to tell you about the dump truck that, you know, they put in the, the city parade. You know, they're going to call on Monday morning and say, hey, what would happen if I had a dump truck in the city parade last weekend, you know, <laughs> or the location or the, you know, the the operations that that you didn't realize they were doing because you didn't ask all those questions. I think the other thing too, that's really, really important right now for agents is understanding how you put yourself into a defensible position in the event something does go south. Like we're in an age right now with litigation where it's insane, but between cyber and umbrella and EB EPLI three classes, that I don't see a lot of the smaller contractors. And I know you guys write a good bit of that. Mm -hmm. Those are things they're not going to just immediately understand that they need, but guess what? You're going to be the one who gets blamed. If you never asked for it, you know, never got them quotes, never presented them, never had them sign something declining coverage because they weren't going to buy it. 
they're just going to blame you and say, well, if I would have known, I would have bought that. 100% of the time, they would have bought the umbrella, right? 100% <laughs> right. of the time, they'd have bought After the, the car. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's interesting because we had um we had Zane Goldthorpe from ProRiders on, and, and contractors are typically ones that are immediately going to tell you no because they don't think that they have any kind of an exposure. But the reality is right now, invoice manipulation is such a huge deal that you've got these contractors that buy their supplies from these national companies they're they are one of the number one targets at this point. So, not to digress into anything regarding that, but you know, I did want to ask you. You mentioned that you have the the excess and surplus, and I, I think that everybody pretty much understands how that point that part of your operation is going to operate. You know, I don't think anybody has recreated a new way to do ENS other than maybe some you know quoting platforms and things like mm -hmm. that. To me, like I said in the intro, I feel like all wholesalers for the most part with the exception of maybe one or two key contracts or maybe they have the pen for a program are all kind of the same and you know the same setup for the most part and i i don't mean any disrespect by that just from the outside looking in sure. you have excess and surplus lines licenses you have contracts with the carriers that a lot of them have contracts with the same carriers and so it's the relationship that drives that what i'm interested in and what i heard you say that differentiates you from some of your competition or much of your competition is that you do things with the admitted markets too. So why don't you talk about that into your business a little bit and kind of the classes of business that, that you really are seeing success with in that end, because even in today's marketplace, there's a lot of agencies and you mentioned you'll work with the smaller ones that are just out there getting started. You might've been somebody who was at a captive and you sold and you decided I'm going to go the furthest thing away from what I did before I'm going to go open an independent and I'm going to focus on commercial instead of home and auto. You got to have markets for that stuff. And if you're not part of an aggregator or you can't get appointments, which is highly likely, you might be a great resource for them. So talk a little bit about that into your business. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, that's exactly right. I mean, we, we have a lot of those agencies that, you know, are just starting out or, you know, maybe they've gotten a little bit of size, but you know, they have, uh, one market or another market on the admitted side, but they don't have really all the top name brands. So, you know, that's, that's what we do. You know, we're a wholesaler that has the best of all worlds. You know, we like to say we're one stop solution because of that reason. And, and that truly is what differentiates us from our competition. So, you know, we, we look at those submissions when they come in and, you know, we look to see who their the incumbent carrier is, uh, depending on who the incumbent carrier is, you know, we may have another admitted solution. Um, I don't don't necessarily want to mention any names. I don't think that's appropriate to do that. But, you know, we, if we see that it's, um, you know, large company A that has the policy and we may have large company B that could be the competitor to that and we could offer a quote through them. And so, you know, as far as the different classes in that, I mean, they, they really range, but, you know, we run a, a lot office, you know, office buildings, um, you know, restaurants, um, you know, janitorial type of accounts. Um, so, you know, really it's kind of all over the place in what we see. You know, we, we really, we, we're not a specialist in anything anymore. We really go after what our agents, most of our agents are not specialists. Right. Let's be honest. So, you know, they get what they have coming through the front door. And they want to quote it. And so kind of going back to what you had, you know, you were talking about before, you know, agents have to also understand they, as much as they want to write business, they don't have to quote everything. They don't have to take those customers that are the most difficult ones to handle. Now, just because they're difficult doesn't mean that they're not worth going after. But I think you, you know, uh, at times you'll meet with it. I'll meet with an agency and they'll say, yeah, I thought there was something a little funny about that one. Uh, you know, if you get a, you know, if your spidey <laughs> really? sense is, you know, going crazy, that maybe you shouldn't do it. You know, I don't care how big the premium is. If it's the wrong customer, it's the wrong customer. And bad things can happen. Um, so, you know, I, I would, I just kind of wanted to digress on what you were saying there. But, you know, just in, in as far as the types of accounts that we write, Really, when I sit down with an agency, I learn what their business is about. What do you go after? 
If it's nothing, it's just whatever comes in your office, good, we can help you with that. If you want to go after a certain class of business, let's talk about it. And if it's something that we feel strongly about, that we have good markets, we're going to tell you. We, like every wholesaler, we don't have every market out there. That's why, you know, you need a couple of wholesalers. You don't need 10, but you need, you know, you need one or two or three maybe. And just make those one or two or three your top wholesalers to go to. Uh, because we all kind of have the same markets at the end of the day, you know, a, you know, a couple of differences here and there. Uh, I think it really comes down to your partnership that you have with the wholesaler. So, you know, when we have agencies that we walk into and, you know, they're a little newer and we sit down and talk to them. And, you know, I, I think it was kind of one of the things that I said to you in the beginning was, you know, we're here to bring value, um, not just be another wholesaler to say, you know, OK, you know, add us as number 10. You have nine already. <laughs> You know, that absolutely uh, that sounds does terrible, no by the way. I couldn't even you know? <laughs> imagine because you've got you've got six of them asking why they don't get any more business than they're getting when you do that. Yeah. Well, and and, it, and that's exactly right, because, you know, when we we know who our competitors are um, and there's a lot of great wholesalers out there. And we when we find out and we also talk to you about your relationship you have with your wholesalers, if you tell me. Everything is great. I love my wholesalers. My underwriters are just, they're all over it. Am I really going to be the one that comes in and tells you, you know what, we can do better? No. Uh, you know, I will say to you, you know what, I haven't found something, you know, I'll try to probe and find out what are they not doing? Is there any, is there any pain that you're having? If there's not, Sometimes it's not the right time. And I believe that timing is everything with partnerships. You know, I mean, you you mentioned to to me when, when we first met, you know, you had a you know un, untimely death with a 20 year uh, underwriter that you had. Which in, you in, know? to your point on relationships, who became a really good personal friend. I mean, to not just right. me, but to my wife, who's not even in the industry. You know, we were we were on their boat for Gasparilla going, you know, for the pirate invasion on their boat coming into um, to Tampa, not even probably like three or four years ago. We would go out to dinner occasionally. I got to be really good friends with her uh, her husband and, and even her kids. And I'm not advocating you need to go to that level with your, your underwriters or your relationship, but it, it's kind of... It's kind of the natural progression of things that happen, you know. I, when my kids ask me what I do for a living, I tell them I make friends for a living. That's what that's what yeah. I have to do first. And when you view your relate, when you view your business is the relationships guiding it and being important. It's one of the reasons why when we lose accounts, which we all do, it hurts because you know we just lost a, a, a relation. Not a, we didn't necessarily lose the relationship, but we lost business from somebody who was more than just a client. Or when we have to go shop a wholesaler for whatever the reason may be, even if it's just to do due diligence to protect ourselves, and maybe we do have that relationship with the one, it stings. But let me tell you something: it stings a lot less when you're open and honest in your communication too. If I have to go and compete, if I have to go to market, because let's just say I have an account with Bracefield and I know that somebody else that you don't have a contract with is hot in the space that we're getting, I owe it to my producers and I owe it to my agency to make sure we cover all of our bases and that I go do that. But you're not going to get surprised by that. I'm going to let the underwriter know up front, number one. Look, I, I really don't want to have to do this, but I have to do it to protect the account. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to be fully transparent with you in the process. I think that's a really important thing that builds a relationship with an underwriter. They may not want to hear the message, but they'll respect you for at least coming to them and being honest with what you're doing. I think Absolutely. the other thing is, you know, a lot of times if I'm in the underwriter's chair, the other thing I really appreciate is if you've been to three of my competitors before you finally decide to give me a chance, don't just send me a submission and have me go to all my markets only to find out I'm blocked. 
say, hey, look, I've already been a couple of places. Here's the marketing list of everybody that was approached. Can you look at this and tell me, is there anything that you have that's going to fill in the gaps? Because we're not seeing what 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 we would expect to see. Mm-hmm. And at least the person can know if they have a fighting chance of getting the business at that point. But I think too many times, again, we don't want to be shopped on price. We don't want to be commoditized as agents. I think it's even more difficult for a wholesaler to not be commoditized for that same very reason. And, you know, I, I just feel like we need to do a better job of as agents sometimes of making sure that even though it sucks to have to give a hard message, you have to give that. It's no different than when you came into my agency the first time I said, look, man, I've got really good relationships and things aren't necessarily going the right way. I'm not going to just give you the lion's share of my business because you walked in, but there's an opportunity here and it is a real opportunity. And we'll start by giving you a few submissions and see how things go. And over time that's picked up. It's probably still not where either one of us want it to end up. But at the end of the day, you're doing exactly what you said you would do for us. And I did not give you any inclination whatsoever that I was going to do anything differently than how I've approached this. And I think that that actually makes the relationship stronger because you know that I set the expectations appropriately on the front end. Yeah, well, I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, this is a long game. You know, I mean, this is a relationship. This is a a slow dance, as I, I would say. And, um you know, uh, while we're all in sales, um, you know, some sometimes agents have said, well, you know, you're the worst salesperson in the world because you you don't pressure anybody. And I say, you know what? I don't believe in that. I don't work like that. Never have, never will. I believe it's all about timing. And if now is not the time, I'm simply going to say when it is the time, here's my card. And you know what? It may be for various reasons that we may end up doing business in the end. Um, But, you know, at the end of the day, I would look like, uh, you know, not a good person if I came in hot and pressured you and called you every five minutes to do business with me. All that's going to do is put you off. So I don't do that. Um, It may be, you know, I, I think that's the right strategy. I've always done business that way. And so um, it's worked over the years that I've done it. So, you know, I, I, you know, we, you know, just kind of getting back to um, agents sending in submissions and, um, you know, trying to block markets and everything else. And, you know, we, we really look at, um, like I said, where we bring value to the table. Um, we, you know, if you are, if we're number 15th in line or number fifth in line uh, for a submission, um, chances are it's already gone to all the markets. So yeah, be, be honest with your wholesaler you're working with. And if you're not, then, you know, that's not really a good, that's not a partnership. Yeah. Here's the newsflash. They're going to figure it out. <laughs> I mean, right. right. Well, cause you're going to do all the work and then you're going to be blocked and then you're going to be kind of, you know, going back to that agent saying, you know, well, Every market that we try, you know, on the brokerage side, if it's binding authority, then, it, you know, it's a bit easier. But if it's a brokerage type account, you know, we all use the same markets. We're all going to the same places. You know, I think, you know, the other thing that, that you know, I would say about us, it's a little bit different is, you know, being part of Bridge Specialty Group, um, you know, a larger organization, we have uh, sister companies, bro- sisters and brothers that we you know, if it's something that we can't do in house, um, and maybe it's a little bit bigger, we have places to go with that. You know, we, you know, we can make introductions to other, uh, you know, our sister companies. Uh, so I think that's important as well. You know, uh, if we can't do something, we'd like to, you know, it's one one of the old things. You know, I know a guy kind of thing. You know, I know a guy that could do this. I know a guy that can do that. I can't, but I'm going to help you out because my my goal at Bracefield, our goal is to help you, the agent, place an account. You know, and maybe we don't necessarily write it here, but we know people that can. And um, believe it or not, you know, I think some people, you know, in the wholesale space, uh, they shy away from that because they feel like all of a sudden now this agent's going to go to another place to get their all their business from now on. I think it's worked the opposite for us. You know, be honest, get the agents what they need. They remember that 
and they keep coming back to you for what it is you're good at. So, you yeah, know, it's funny, man, because say. you tell that story. Um, it works on the retail side too. You know, I was here this morning and Nicole, who's in the office next to mine, was on speakerphone with a lady who called in that was looking for specific coverage. And I heard Nicole like kind of not necessarily struggling or fumbling, but she, I don't think she was a hundred percent sure how to answer this lady. And so I stepped out of my office, walked around the corner, listened for a couple of seconds. And I said, ma'am, I said, yeah, you don't know me. I'm one of the agents that works here. My name's David. And I've heard what you're talking about. I said, you know, I want to be honest with you. I, I think that what you're asking, you really don't need to buy another policy for it should be covered here. And here's where, where you should look and, you know, what I would recommend. And I said, you know, obviously I would love to earn your, your business, but I'm more, more important to me would be to earn your trust first. Mm -hmm. I would, I would call the company that's working with you right now and just mention these three things to them. And you can probably save yourself some money and get the peace of mind knowing that you actually do have coverage that you don't realize you have. And I said, and here's why. And I gave her all of the talking points. I spent like 10 minutes with this lady and basically was talking her out of us going to market for her for this, because I didn't feel like it was the right thing for her based on what she said. And she goes, I've learned more in 10 minutes of listening to you tell me this stuff than I have from all of these other people. All they want to do is send me applications and get, you know, get me the quotes or whatever else. She said, you actually, gave me very, very valuable information. And she said, well, I'm probably going to end up staying where I'm at as a result. I have no problem referring anybody that's in my circle to you. Or if my needs change in the future, you're going to be the first call that I make because I really appreciate you taking the time to educate me on this. And I'm a hundred percent like you, man. I think a lot of people probably think to be successful in middle market commercial that you have to be pushy. You have to be aggressive you have to have a little bit of an edge on you. You have to be competitive, but at the end of the day, education wins every single time, in my opinion. It might 100%. not win today, but it'll win next year if you invest in that education today, because what's going to happen is you're going to give somebody a different point of view. And even if they stay with their incumbent or they go with one of your competitors because of the insurance deal, instead of really looking at things the way we do in terms of total cost of risk or whatever else, when something doesn't work out and it happens to be one of those things that you brought up and warned them could happen, who do you think they're going to call to fix that? <laughs> Absolutely. They're going to think of you. And, you know, that that 10 minutes that you spent with that customer, it's going to go it's going to go miles uh, down the road. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I, look, man, I grew up in the grocery industry. I had to get people to spend $100 in a shopping cart to have a dollar of net profit. So I don't wow. want anybody out there that I ever interact with to leave not being better than they were before we had the conversation. If I can't accomplish that, I need to figure out a different career to be in. But, you know, we didn't have social media. We didn't have Yelp and Google reviews and all of that stuff back in those days. We had mom who had a great experience or a bad experience sitting in the bleachers at Little League telling everybody what her experience was. And we had no way to measure that stuff back then. So I've carried yeah. a lot of that same mentality into how we run the agency, how we service people today, just because it's even more paramount that you do your job the right way, because somebody could cut you just like that and, and go and trash you online. I mean, I, I had a really negative experience with a major brand this last week and they felt it. I promise you because their corporate office called me to try and remedy the situation after the fact, and I'm not one of these people that just flies off the handle and goes on social and posts. Somebody's got to have struck out like five, six, seven times before it ever happens. And at some point, enough's enough. I don't want to see it happen to anybody else. Not everybody's that patient in the approach. You, a lot of people, you get one time to screw up. And if you do it, you're automatically going to get thrown under the bus from somebody. So, you know, yeah. I really appreciate the fact that that's how you conduct business because it resonates with me. I'm 100% the same way. I'm okay if I don't get the deal this year as much as I would like it, but I'm not going to ruin my opportunity for the future by acting like a moron today and, and throwing a fit or being overly aggressive because you got to understand how people communicate, how they receive what you're giving them. And if you don't do that right, you're never going to win. Yeah, yeah, good luck. I agree. Listen, man, we're getting close to uh, coming up on the hour. 
Um, what do we leave out? Anything? I mean, how, how does any, if anybody wants to learn more about Bracefield, how they could work with you, learn more about your markets, appetites, all of that stuff, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, well, you know, simply you can go to our website, bracefield.com. It's B-R-A-I-S-H. F I E L D dot com. Don't forget the I. A lot of people do. Um, or J Barfield at com. So that's my email address. I'm on LinkedIn. That's probably, if you want to get me, go to LinkedIn, search up John Barfield and link in with me. I would love to. And yeah, let's, you know, let's see what we can do to help you grow your business. That's we'll have goal. all of that stuff in the show notes for you. So all you got to do is click. I'm not even going to make it hard for you to find my man. So we'll awesome. make it very, very easy. Well, listen, as we wrap up, number one, thank you very much for coming on today. Um, number two, and probably uh, selfishly more important, is thank you for what you guys are doing to help us in the agency. I know just based on the, the short time we've been working together, about l- a little less than a year now, that you are going to fit in exactly where I needed you to. And, you know, for me, as as much as I'm a tech forward person, I'm still a bit old school when it comes to the relationship end of this game. And, um, you know, just talking with you, seeing how you guys operate, I feel like I'm home with you guys. So I really, really appreciate that personally. And I know that my producers and my staff here do as well. So, I don't know what how much more of a glowing endorsement I could give for Bracefield to those of you listening, but if you're not getting that, then you probably need to click on one of the links to connect with them because I can tell you it's been an exceptional experience for us, and I would be remiss if I didn't uh, didn't encourage you to reach out. So thanks again for your time today, John. I really appreciate it, and we're going to see you in Key West in about you betcha. two months at Producers yeah, in Paradise. Looking, looking forward really to forward to that. You're going to have a blast getting to know everybody down there. Thank you, David. Appreciate having me on the podcast and uh, thanks for the business. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Have a great day.